Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Matthew Miller, the Fedora Project Leader, and this is our monthly Fedora Council video meeting. We normally conduct our business on mailing lists, tickets, IRC, um, and try not to depend too much on video meetings, but it's nice to have the high bandwidth times sometimes. And we basically, once a month, we focus on an important topic and have a guest from some part of the project to uh, talk to us about you know, what's going on there. And today we have uh, Daniel and Jan, who uh, work at Red Hat on the, um, what is the name of your group? Packaging Tools? No, no, it's Software Management. Software Management, awesome, that's the thing. So that's um, DNF, RPM. Um, do you have GNOME Software now? Uh, uh, yeah, just, just, mod but it was yeah, just modularity. Here. <laughs> okay, and and just uh, this this little thing called modularity <laughs> as well. Uh, so um, and uh, recently, this team took over the modularity project from um, a different team in engineering that have been focused on modularity. And so uh, we're going to learn a little bit about you know how that transition is going, uh, what the plans are, and then we're going to talk a little bit more about the future of modularity in Fedora, which is going to be exciting. Uh, I see we have some people from FESCO on the call here as well, the Engineering Steering Committee. Uh, in general, a pretty wide audience. Um, so um, I think mostly we'll let um, Daniel and Jan do the presentation first, um, and um, mostly we'll hold questions to the end. They'll have some questions, um, and then we'll take general questions and then we'll see how things go from there. Does that sound good? Good. All right. Um, and I'm going to mute myself because although it's quiet right now, there's um, train line construction one block away from me and it's been very loud this morning. So I'll, I'll let you do the talking. Thank you, Matthew. So I will start and first I would introduce myself and my colleagues. So my name is Jan Beran and I'm manager of software management team. Daniel is team lead in this team and uh, uh, he is also expert of uh, topics which are related to software management and also uh, release management from past. And Jaroslav Mraček, who is uh, uh, our developer and he is the key person in the NF team who is uh, who has been involved in modularity. So any question, technical question which will be raised, uh, these guys will help me to uh, answer everything. So I will share start to share my presentation. So can you see the initial? Uh, page of my. It showed up and then it went away yes. again. Yeah, it was yeah, there for, for just a second. a second. Does it work? N nope. Nope. Okay. So just a, just again, I don't know what happened. There we go. It's there now. Great. So we uh, did a survey in April. The purpose of that survey was to collect feedback on modularity. Uh, we published the survey on Federal Devel and internal Red Hat mailing list in April 3. And it was also shared in other mailing lists uh, of Fedora and Apple Devel. And during three weeks, we received 193 responses, which is, I think, great. Uh, and you, can I ask a quick question? Do you know how many of those? Oh, the, your graph there shows me my questions. See, I should wait till the end for questions. Please continue. OK, so there are four sections. Uh, I don't know. Go. I don't go in details. There was some also uh, regarding privacy that we do not share any data from that. Just uh, the statistics, and with data only a limited number of people uh, can see them to prepare the evaluation. 
Uh, regarding the structure of respondents, uh, there were 22% of people from Red Hat Com. There were uh, approximately the same number of uh, others, and uh, more than a half people were anonymous. Uh, most of people were contributors of Fedora, so 162. There were also contributors in RHEL, people, and so on, also combinations. We also ask about the role of uh, respond respondents because it's important what is the audience. So there was 33% uh, of uh, developers and the same amount of packages. So it means that 66% uh, of people are anyhow involved in uh, Linux development or uh, the packaging. Some of them were also in other primary roles. On the other hand, we know that the people combine their roles. So if somebody is primary role developer, that person can be also packager and vice versa. We also ask about uh, the contribution, how it is funded. So 43% uh, were Red Hatters, and the same amount of people were contributing or are contributing in their free time, so which is interesting. Uh, another question, which is key one, how, how the respondents are satisfied with modularity if they like it. So yeah, this, uh, this answer was not positive. Only 12% uh, answered that they like it. 39, uh, their answer was neutral, and uh, almost half people answered that they dislike modularity. Another question was if modularity solves their problem. So for 15%, uh, the answer was yes. For 70%, the answer was no. Um, We also ask about problems, uh, and uh, because it's uh, important to understand what problems uh, are there for the users or packages. So the main uh, portion was the user experience. Uh, it was 62% of people facing that problem. Another big uh, area was uh, system upgrade, uh, 46%. Problems with modular RPMs overriding non-modular RPMs, 44%. And uh, some others. So you can see it here sorted based on the percentage of uh, respondents uh, uh, for each particular issue. We also uh, investigated based on uh, the text in uh, other questions what uh, they put other problems or some details pro uh, people are facing. So for 42 uh, respondents, modality is too complicated or over engineered. Uh, another big uh, uh, group was that uh, people uh, can see problems with uh, installation upgrades, dependencies, and 11 respondents answered that they face uh, build problems. You can see also the other uh, answers here in this slide. We were also interested about understanding of terms which are used in modularity. On that graph, you can see the statistics of uh, understanding uh, that the uh, answers were correct or partially correct or incorrect uh, regarding the terms. And the baseline is number of respondents who answered at least one question, which is uh, 107 respondents. Here, what is, I think, important is the average on the bottom, which means 
that uh, only 20% uh, of uh, answers were correct and 16% uh, partially correct. The same numbers, but uh, calculated based on uh, and based on answers of each question, what is the percentage? And it is sorted out based on the sum of correct or partial correct answers uh, on that graph. Again, you can see the average, so approximately 50, uh, no, 52% uh, understand uh, at least partially uh, the terms which are used in modality. We know there are some, we identified there are many confusions what the terms really are. We ask, we, we, we ask also about problems which are solved by modality to the respondents. So for, uh, 24 answered that uh, uh, providing an alternative content is the feature that they that is solved for them uh, for improving packaging and distribution three decreasing support and maintenance cost uh, 13 people answered that uh, in opposite way that there are some problems which are created by modularity we also uh, saw some other answers from the text, uh, what are highlighted benefits for seven respondents was uh, federal availability for four of them, life cycle. So we uh, were focused on each area and uh, would like to present plan uh, for the main topics, uh, what we see as a problem. So the first one is related to understanding of uh, modularity, the terms, uh, the documentation gaps. So we are focusing on that and working on that. And also we use the experience from the survey to create a glossary, which uh, includes the terms and description, what it really means. The feedback from the survey was used as an input, so we believe that it can uh, help to clarify uh, better uh, the meaning of each term. Currently, there is one guy working on that. Uh, he already finished, uh, let's say, the first uh, initial steps, and now we are working on a review of the documentation and uh, we expect that it will be available in the end of this month. Of course, we should continue on that and uh, any help from the community is welcome. Regarding system upgrade, it is another issue which is uh, very important. So, uh, we expect to, sol to solve that in Federal 33 and also in Federal 34. Uh, it is necessary to add some metadata uh, and uh, also to work with infrastructure to solve all of that. But uh, it is uh, this this era is we understand it is very important and to improve the experience with system upgrade. Uh, another area was uh, model and non-model RPMs, uh, which uh, was already fixed in Federal 32. And uh, problems regarding uh, overriding uh, uh, with uh, non-model RPMs with uh, uh, model RPMs. Honestly, it works as it was designed. However, we understand that uh, this is uh, this can be an issue, and uh, we would like to ask uh, people that uh, they uh, file a bug if they can see anything uh, uh, that uh, doesn't work as they expect. We can discuss uh, 
what do, what to do with uh, this issue. Another area is uh, building, managing, and distributing modules. So it means tools which are which are needed for, uh, like for example, to build modules locally and so on. We are working currently on that. Uh, there is a guy from uh, another team who is just uh, uh, progressing with that and. Uh, we expect that uh, something will be available very soon during uh, this month. Another issue was related to switching module streams, which is not straightforward. And uh, this, uh, we plan to fix the, this issue in Fedora 34. Uh, so uh, it will be uh it is in our our uh plan to 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 cover that and fix that and the error is uh source control management like uh, this git for example so it's related to policies uh we believe that the policies should be reviewed and uh, uh, it is not the technology issue uh, modularity was designed to uh, to uh, to do many things, but uh, there is a there is there is a lot of freedom to do what to do with packages and uh, in modules. However, uh, there can be conflict, so uh, we believe that it is necessary to think about some rules or restrictions how to use that and to eliminate some conflicts by policies and guidelines. So this is something that uh, people from the community also are welcome to uh, work on that. If you can see an issue, uh, you can see here links uh, where you can file uh, either uh, issues in modality tracker or use uh, uh bugzilla for uh, for filing bugs and also uh there there is a reference to moderate documentation with details how you can report bugs and issues which you can see so that's all from my side very brief overview uh, you can see this presentation with some additional data in the blog which was already published uh, on, uh, uh, on on federal block and now it's time for questions yeah um, uh, that was very interesting thank you very much um, I especially like the charts and graphs it's uh, kind of a thing um, I'm actually curious uh, do you plan to rerun this survey um, it makes a um, interesting baseline and it would be nice to, to see you know a year from now or even six months from now like if uh, how how things are changing based on the work that planned uh we have not considered yet but uh, you are right it can be interesting to to do such a survey again uh but for our information, we agreed also with at Red Hat with product management that they will do a survey for uh, uh, in our customers that we can see also the feedback regarding end user experience. Yeah, uh, yeah, it was basically this was a hundred percent contributor developer feedback or 95 percent something like that, right? Um, so, which is very interesting and super important. That's obviously an area where we've got. Some serious problems um, with, um, you know, people don't like it. So th that that's not good. We want to be building something people like. Um, and but yeah, um, that user feedback would be really great. But I also would love to see yeah this redone um, just to kind of see if things are progressing in the right direction. If we can provide something that people are happier with and that you know solve you know as we do these things to solve the issues if they're actually solving them. Um, I guess you know, there's been some discussion in FESCO about you know, the future of modularity and the scope of it. Um, I'm, I'm really happy to see the 
there's, I think there's some fear that, frankly, Red Hat tends to get things to like 60% done and say, this is too hard and then cut their funding. Uh, I've seen it happen over and over again. Um, and I, I, I'm glad to see your plan. Well, you know, it has some concrete steps that are really gonna address some of the big outlying things rather than rather than just dropping it because I think we do have a lot of potential here. Um, in, in the FESCO discussion, there was uh, talk about use cases, and I think it's an exercise that we went through like you know five years ago, or earlier on in the modularity life cycle, and uh, things have things have changed a little bit. But there are definitely some use cases that I want to see covered that we are not covering super well right now. Um, one is the I, I'm an end user and I would like a different version of such and such an application. And I think we have the technology there pretty well to do that. Um, we don't have the content there because the uh, packaging experience is, is not making it easy to do that. Um, but the, the technology for I want to switch between you know, end user applications, it, that, that works pretty well um, you know, with the upgrade problem solved and, and so on, hand waving. Um, one of the second things is I would like this to be a bridge between CentOS Stream and Fedora packaging um, with you know, Apple. And, um, and that's because, it, this again relates to those content streams, we actually have two streams of content that lots of people are working on all the time. And they're very, very similar and they can live side by side um, and so it would be really nice if someone working on a piece of software could easily build that for both CentOS Stream and Fedora uh, without really thinking too much about what the underlying operating system is. Um, you know, what obviously dependencies and things need to be managed, but I want to be able to build this for, for either one because that um, theoretically should make my life better as a packager, but also it provides users with those different streams of content that we're already working on. Um, and then the third one is this uh, uh, use case of our various um, spins and Fedora offerings for different use cases. So um, the example I gave in the FESCO ticket, which I think is a pretty good one, um, at a large university I used to work for, they had a Fedora-based image that they used for instruction for their intro to computer science class. One of the most popular uh, computer science class at the university, um, like very huge. Uh, but they w would basically take a version of Fedora and use that version for like four years, even though it passed its life end of life, because they didn't want to update their curriculum material to match the newer version of uh, Fedora, which is understandable, but frustrating. So what would be nice is if they could, um, you know, basically that's, you don't want the, the compiler you're using changing too much underneath you. You don't want new version of Python going from one version to the next. So what I would like, this is a long way to say it, but uh, for, for example, the Python Classroom Lab to be able to update every six months but to have its primary version of Python be, you know, maybe state the same for an academic calendar year or whatever that's based on the needs of that particular use. Maybe the, um, you know, the tools that the robotics lab needs for robots, they want to have, you know, a consistent version of it, even as that software, the mainline version of that, you know, gets revved to newer versions in Fedora, I'd like to hold to a certain version for a certain amount of time. So I would like our different offerings to be able to do that. That's that's the basic request, and mostly that's um, I, the use case is going to be um, language stacks. But I can also see it for applications and some other things like that. And it's possible. I, I don't know, but it. I would like to have the possibility for you know of other things um, that could could be different because I want these spins to be able to explore different options and make their own choices. So I. See this as enabling technology for that. Um, there might be some other use cases, but kind of those those three things are the main ones that come to mind. Does that make sense? And do those things fit with where you see things going? So people in the chat are oh. commenting that you can already do this without modules. Okay. Um, 
Well, in some ways you can, but um, when, when you update your Fedora version, um, if, if for Python, for example, um, the you, if you want to run an older Python command, you might have to tell people, you know, use this version number or whatever, and you have to update all, you may have to update your materials. Um, but we, we don't right now have a way for spins to provide you know, a different version of the stack um, than is on, a, we could maybe use SCLs or something, but that um, has its own set of problems. Um, and we certainly don't have an easy way for the CentOS and Fedora um, packages to be built um, across both bases without this. I mean, you can basically, you can copy the spec file back and forth, but then you end up basically with forked spec file rather than the same thing. Um, so I don't know if it's okay to jump in and to say something. Yeah, sure. Uh, this is, this is, is Bishak. Uh, um, actually, maybe I can do this. Uh, so as mentioned in the chat, uh, it is certainly possible to do this kind of thing already. Um, I mean, even the, the, the thing that you mentioned with the uh, executable name, right now we have a uh, unversioned Python uh, package that provides a symlink. And if you're going to host a, a class for a university, you, it is certainly within your uh, uh, technical scope to, to do a package that does any kind of thing like this for your students. But this is this is just one side of the argument. The other side of the argument is that modules are a particularly bad uh, way to solve this issue because of this overrides, right? I mean, everything you, so the idea is to stick hundreds of package, Python packages into this, this uh, single module, and then you deploy this on a system and, uh, how do you know what gets replaced? You don't know, right? And uh, I mean, yes, it is a solution that is one of the possible solutions, but I, I, it's not appealing technically uh, in any way. Um, and it's going to generate many, many conflicts and many, many uh, hard to solve issues. And uh, so, I mean, this is just not a good example for this feature. If you try to replace a stack like this, you, it's going to be extremely painful. So, um, I, I guess part of this, the um, you don't know what to be replaced. Um, I think that might be a, a that's a user experience UI problem in a lot of ways because certainly the tools know what package. I mean, the part, part of the idea of having a module rather than just a collection of packages that are all basically compat packages is that you have the metadata about what this module is, what this set of packages is, where they come from, and that they work together. And so you should be able to actually list directly, this is the contents of this module. Yes. This is what and we're getting, right? In a normal distro version, you have uh, uh, packages that depend on one another. And now you're sometimes even implicitly, right? Because people uh, update a few packages and don't always specify that uh, a specific sub package got a bug fix, uh, and uh, this gets. I mean, those those issues get discovered and fixed as the the, the distro uh, is updated over over its lifetime. And now you are going to stop this, and you're going to put in overrides for specific package versions from. Uh, I mean, with versions that don't bear any relations to the ones that you have in the distro. And this is just going to break in many, many small cases. Well, I mean, that's that's my expectation. It's like like you took a, a package from Fedora 31 that you can not possibly install on Fedora 32. Chances are that it will not work as expected. Yes, this is this is part of the design when you actually select the module which replaces the system packages. Uh, other packages in the distribution might break, but you. You must expect that when you actually uh, install alternative software. The, the the idea behind the module bundle is that uh, the content of the module works together. So you need to replace packages that, uh, to ensure that the module itself works together. There's there's no guarantee that everything else in the distribution of 25,000 packages will continue working with the replacement. Uh, 
that is that is correct. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm uh, exactly. This is part of the design, and uh, even at the small scale that we had this in Fedora, this was a source of problems, right? Trying to do it, it at a large scale, a, you yes, only yes, multiply yes. this. Yes, but it's also a key feature of that, so it depends on what you want to achieve. Okay, okay, I, I completely agree, agree with you. Yeah. Is it okay if I jump into this and say something? Yeah, Neil, let's hear what you have to say. So I kind of get a little bit of both sides here when it comes to like the idea of having modular content to provide um, self-contained sets of alternative functionality or content or whatever. Um, but providing alternative language stacks um, only would work in a modular context um, if you essentially made sure that the entire set of, package, uh, of, of packages that depend on that language stack are included. So for example, Python is one that I tend to work with quite a lot, and Python is actually the most painful language stack to deal with um, if I look at from the RHEL side, because every alternate version provided in as a language stack variant is incomplete compared to the default one. Um, and part of this is also that the tools that we have for this are just not, they're not self-resolving. So like, let's say I, I make a module and say, I want a different Python language. And what should be happening is that the tooling should say, okay, let's look at the, the set of things that depend on this. Here's all the stuff. Uh, do you want to include all this so that you can build a new module that like slots right in perfectly? And then it should cycle, figure all that stuff out. Like I, I'm not going to go particular in the details, but the idea is that if you make a module of a language stack, you should expect to make the module as functionally complete as what you provided before, um, in a, either in the non-modular context or in a different module. Because otherwise, you get weird expectations and weird inconsistencies, and I think that is the, the ultimate problem that leads to the poor user experience. Whether it's a module or a separate repository or alternatives or whatever, like, I, I don't really care. Like, the problem is that the content has to be functionally equivalent so that things are still useful in all the ways that people are using them, especially with modules being fully conflicting and shadowing other content. Right, so I think uh, it, the, the stream expansion feature modularity is meant to address that, um, whether or not that's a complete solution or not, um, you know, details. It, it, um, it is, um, but it requires the maintainers of all the packages that depend on your language thing to also modularize their content. Right, so it, it's the technology is there, but it requ requi it makes more work for people. Um, and or It also and, requires and, infinite computational resources. There is that too. There is the whole everything's got to be well, rebuilt every single time without sharing anything. Yeah. Um, right. And it, it 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 gets complicated very quickly. Um, so I think some of this uh, can be addressed by um, one of the things we don't have, which is if, if there can always be a base stack that is that is you don't need to have infinite parallel installability, but if you can make it so um, if if there's always a base uh, language stack that is always there and like a you know, system Python stack basically um, that can be depended on by other distro packages and then they have the modules be or whatever whatever they are uh, be independent of that. Um, but that needs that, this needs some working on and working out obviously. Um, I mean at that point you're talking there, there's also there's the the policy question of what should modules be scoped to. And then there's the technical question of how to discover and automatically construct a functionally useful module. Like we don't, both of those pieces are missing today. We have tooling to build modules. We have the functionality underneath to make such things possible, but we don't have the, the, the um, I guess in language, con it's in programming context, like the sugar to, to make it so that people can do the, right thing easily without pain. So Neil, as it happens, Stephen Gallagher is working on a new modular policy. I'm, I'm not sure if he shared the link uh, in the FESCO ticket. I can I can put it here in the chat. It's available. That'd be useful. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Terry, do you have something to add there? You were making some faces. Yeah, um, I, I was going to ask if it would be OK if I back up and, and share with some with everyone some of the original goals and visions that that led 
to where we are today. Would that be okay? That would be awesome. Why don't you also introduce yourself for the recording for people who yes. don't recognize you? Yes, I was going space. to do that as well. Uh, my name is Terry Bowling, and I am on the uh, RHEL, Red Hat Enterprise Linux product management team. Um, and I work closely with the DNF and, and other system management tooling. Uh, that's my uh, area of, of focus. Um, I was not part of the earliest stage discussions that led up to modularity, um, but I've, I've been caught up to speed. I joined the team about three years ago. Um, and, and so these discussions had already been going on for a year or two prior to that. So the problems that led to this discussion were we were seeing both RHEL and Fedora having the challenge of how do we provide our users access to more content, but still provide a curated, tested, stable distribution environment. Um, and the use case needs of Fedora is a bit different than, than RHEL, um, but we also saw the ongoing continuing trend and adoption, particularly in the cloud, where Ubuntu LTS and CentOS were just infinitely more popular or, or used than, than uh, Fedora. Uh, part of the problem is there's a whole other set of problems where pre-built Fedora images are not available in the cloud. I, I don't want to confuse the discussion. That's that's an entirely separate set of meetings to discuss. Um, but and plus, I need a lot of whiskey for that conversation. <laughs> yes, uh, you and me both. Um, and so I don't mean to open that can of worms, but we have to acknowledge that fact. And so Rel is deeply concerned about the adoption and growth of the average Fedora user, particularly in those university scenarios like you described, which I have lived. I've been a Fedora user for, well, since it came out and, and Red Hat Linux 9 before that. Um, and I used to teach at a university and I experienced that pain. If I wanted to stay on top of the, the latest Fedora core release, I had to rewrite much of my my lab and curriculum uh, every semester in order to keep up with the change because inevitably something would, would change. Um, and now I teach a robotics class at my daughter's school and the tooling to interact with the VEX robotics, which is extremely popular in the US and used for a lot of university STEM uh, curriculums, my choices are either Ubuntu uh, LTS or uh, Mac or Windows. So I can't use Fedora to teach my, my daughters and my students this robotic stuff. And I'm not a developer. I'm just your average, less than average dumb user, right? So, um, so those are some of the problems, the, the growing fast adoption of uh, Ubuntu LTS. And when we have sales enterprise conversation, con sales conversations with enterprises, we increasingly hear a trend of they've got things newly developed in their business and they're turning into production because they work and they were written either on CentOS or Ubuntu LTS because that's what the students were using in college. So it directly impacts financial and sales conversations when we talk to our REL customers uh, because it's a growing trend. Another can of worms that we don't want to open right now is you know, Windows, WSL 2, and, and the growing adoption of Ubuntu in that space. Again, Ubuntu LTS is extremely important to the average user who is either a developer in a, like a business setting, not a developer as a, a Linux distribution maintainer. Those two developer personas are very different. Um, so 
I, I wanted to highlight that when we saw and interpreted the Fedora modularity survey that Jan presented earlier, that was a very obvious thing that we noticed was, Matthew, you mentioned this as well, that um, a high, a large majority of the participants of that survey were uh, Fedora distribution package maintainers or, or developers or both, um, which is important. I do not want to minimize the the pain that we have inflicted on our Fedora developers. It is real. You are correct. Uh, we hear you and we want to solve this with you. Um, but we have another user base as well that we see as really important, both to RHEL and to Fedora. We'd love to see more average users using Fedora um, and quit using Ubuntu LTS instead. Um, and so that was one of the hopes. RHEL product manager didn't, RHEL product management did not ask for modularity. What we asked for is the ability to provide and curate at the distribution level, more options for our users to help our users more easily transition to a next major release like RHEL 7 to RHEL 8 without being forced to switch their PHP or, um, or Postgres stack or, or whatever is important to their application needs, as well as how can we provide more choices to make Fedora more usable without forcing that technical debt of upgrading uh, and, and everything on users. Give them more options so that they can update their applications when they're ready, but still be able to use the latest Fedora release. Um, and the engineering implementation that was delivered to us to solve that was modularity. So RHEL product management didn't ask for modularity itself. We asked, please solve this, these user problems and help us grow both, both the Fedora and RHEL communities. Um, so that said, we have been watching the, the Pagir threads 21, uh, 2114. I have that number memorized. I've, I've read every single comment. Um, we're very interested in working with you and open to the idea. And, and Jan, I can't remember if you mentioned this in your presentation earlier, but you're having discussions about if and when we can start work on or, or plan an evolutionary design change based on all the discussions with, with the um, people on this call. So we are open to that. However, RHEL 8 has a 10-year life cycle. And we have to fix, we have to stop the bleeding and we have to, to fix our patient now. And we're asking for your help. Um, if, if you can be patient with us and help us fix some of the problems that we have now, we're listening to you and we want to take your input and work with you on what you recommend as a better solution to solving these user um, these user experience problems. And the user experience problems, I mean back to the original, we need to provide more options to our users. Some of that was around uh, policy Perry? guideline. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, I so long. Yeah, Pe uh, Petter's been trying to get your attention to ask a question for a while. I don't think you may not. Well, Terry can finish. <laughs> this is just a question about bureaucracy and whether you still intend to formalize your development plan as a new federal modularity objective in the future, or if this is just going to be happening without any formal schedule and plans. Are you asking me that or the modularity oh, team? The software management team in general. Jan, would you like to answer that? Yeah, so currently the team is working on the goals or tasks which I described. Regarding the objectives, the question is about distinct or to distinguish short-term and long-term goals. 
I would suppose that we should agree long-term goals in the objectives, not just only short-term. So the, the objectives and, should be are, are actually kind of paced, placed in the middle. They're they're meant they're not necessarily um, eventual goals. They're things that are meant to be achieved in like a 12 to 18 month time frame. Um, and that's why part part of the problem we had with modularity and objectives originally was that it turned out to be a much bigger thing than the 12 to 18 months. And so we kind of had to do it in uh, objectives in phases, and that that wasn't entirely successful as a bureaucracy process. Uh, but yeah, if it, um, I, I think from a Fedora Council point of view, it would be really helpful to have this as an objective, whatever we whatever we name it, because um, we definitely have a problem, and we've got we've got some things that we want that we aren't at yet. Um, so I think an objective would be helpful. Um, going to uh, what, what Terry was talking about a little bit. Um, wait, let me let you get a word in edgewise, then I have more to say. What, what were you going to say, Jan? Yeah, just uh, I fully agree. And our plan is, let's say, for the time frame at the end of this calendar year, let's say, or in Fedora 34, not for a longer time period. However, I think that we should think also about some. If you are uh, if you are talking about eighteen months, it's a longer period, and in that case, we should also think uh, who will cover that, because currently we are ready to do what we what I presented. But uh, there are discussions in the community about other options, and I do not see still an agreement. What is the best way uh, regarding modularity? And I would like to see that. So I think it is this meeting is also the great opportunity to discuss that. Because yeah. if we are considering to open something like a new project, like uh, because there are such uh, proposals, this team can't drive that. It is impossible. Yeah. And on the other hand, it doesn't make sense to create a new project which will not collaborate with the current project. Because if we are in the real world with some conditions and we can't just cut or kill this project, we should continue. We have some obligations. So I believe that we should find, uh, we should find some agreement how to proceed further and based on that to set up the objectives. So, um, yeah, uh, I, I kind of come from the same point of view of as Terry. Uh, you know, I have have these problems. I, I I see that I want to Fedora to offer something unique to our user base that says if you use Fedora, you have these options that you don't with other free Linux distros. Um, that's Compelling um, and modularity was you know, the th the technology developed to answer that question. Um, it may seem um, to some people on this call that I'm weirdly loyal to this, even though it's not popular in the community and not working. Um, I think so my loyalty comes from the fact that we had a team of people, you know, had Red Hat commit actual engineering work into Fedora, and we had a team of people. You work in Fedora. Um, obviously, we had some problems with the RHEL 8 timeframe where a lot of the work ended up being rushed behind, you know, in, inside Red Hat instead of um, being developed in Fedora. Like it would, it would have, it would have been awesome if we had another year to bake this before RHEL 8 came out. But that's just how the timelines worked out. Um, but we we have a a team of people who worked really hard in doing this in a community way. Um, and sometimes things are not 100% successful. We, we need to give people the opportunity to not have, not have to do everything perfectly in order to um, be able to progress forward. And you know, if things aren't working, sometimes you throw it out. Sometimes you say, okay, what can we do to move this forward in a, you know, in a better way and just as we go on? I think project has seen a lot of adjusting as it's gone on. We went from the, you know, everything is modular approach to the, um, you know, base repo, the thing we have now, which is very different. 
Um, we have some comments from Neil in the chat here, which I think will not get into the video. Um, one, one of them is that um, uh, that modularity as it is actually seems a, a long way towards solving these user problems, even though it's difficult, um, even though the, um, the, the technology is almost there, um, but that we have this problem where we're not getting the content because the user experience of the packaging side and the tooling is is rough. So um, I actually still have some optimism for this current technology, and I think that we can actually get something that does provide us with what we need in Fedora. Um, on a technical note, one one of the things that I think it is important about the, the approach taken, and maybe you know, the architecture may be too confusing and complicated, but I think the basic concept of having the module metadata be separate from an RPM spec file is really key to working on this. It's the same thing we had when back in the dawn of time, RPMs were grouped together by a group tag, and that's what you know, was presented to users, what group they belonged in, and that turned out to be horrible, and then comps was developed as a alternative thing that you know, was basically the metadata for groupings lives outside of the packages. Now, comps isn't perfect and could have used some updating over the years, but it's clearly a better approach to have this outside of the package. And so I think a lot of the, I, I think that's fundamental to whatever we need. Um, and a lot of the complexity in design kind of comes out of that. Um, so that, that might be going into the weeds. But um, again, that's, that's um, something I'm pretty attached to. And I, I think a lot of the other solutions um, proposed don't offer the flexibility that TAP has. <clears throat> Well, there was also a small piece of that up until about five years ago, um, native RPM, like without patches, like without the SUSE or Mandriva patches, uh, didn't support weak or conditional dependencies. And without those pieces, like the, the, the functional installable groups concept that we have with composition groups or comps groups, as a lot of people call it, or even with modules, um, was literally not possible. Like without, without that, it was literally not possible. And the old RPM philosophy back then was that this functionality didn't belong in RPM. That has obviously changed. I don't, but whether that means anything for solving all of the problems is a different question. But like, that was like some of the underlying background to why this wasn't, why we had like this externalized weirdo metadata thing for, for groups um, instead of like, putting it in the package spec. Well, the, the big thing with uh, comps is that it also lets packages be in multiple groups and RPMs, mm -hmm. that, uh, whether or not that's a good thing. Um, I uh, Since I, I have the floor now, I want to get a few yeah. words in. Um, Terry, thank Go you for it. Coming. Uh, appreciate that uh, as always. Um, I think we're missing one key thing that Terry mentioned uh, is that the need for Fedora LTS um, needs to be uh, considered since uh, Ubuntu LTS is really popular. I, I don't see why we don't do Fedora LTS. Um, but back to the modularity point, um, I do see the, the, the use cases as described. They do make sense to me. Um, but I do have concerns around the developer experience side of the house. Um, if it can't be explained to a developer or a package maintainer succinctly, then it's probably not a complete implementation. Um, I'm not saying bad implementation, it's just not fully baked. And I do think focusing on that is important for us to see any success with this. If the um, the package maintainers can't wrap their heads around it, it's not gonna go anywhere. So you've seen my comments, the scope of this, the, you know, what what is expected of modularity uh, maintainers, things like this. These are questions that are unanswered right now and they just, modules just sort of exist uh, as they exist in the state in Rel8 and that's how they landed. So I, I would put importance around the developer side of this uh, thing and if, that takes us in other directions, fine, but um, that seems to be the key missing piece. And I will shut up now. Yeah, no, thank you, David, that's super helpful. Um, so uh, I, I, you know, we're gonna run out of time in this meeting, but 
Um, one of the things I think that is important at this point, I, we, I see there's a Red Hat commitment to working this out. And I think we've provided a space in Fedora where that can be done with the ELN. And I know there's a there's an ongoing conversation about whether um, default modules can be used in ELN um, in order to uh, to work on some of these things. I would really like to encourage Fesco to find a way to let that happen because otherwise that work is going to have to be done um, outside of Fedora or not at all. And that would be a fairly, it, it's not that Red Hat doesn't have to solve this, Red Hat has to solve it. So let's make sure that there's a space to work on it that's in Fedora so that we you know, kind of keep that, that collaboration going and keep the energy also looking at Fedora needs as well and not just um, end up solving a rel internal problems rel internally and not actually working on the um, Fedora community uh, side of things as well. Um, yeah. I, I know that. So, yeah. So, uh, um, so the stuff that Terry said about uh, mm, what people want and what the general goal is, this is very much true. And we also see this in the modularity survey that basically the most common answer that why people like modularity is alternative versions. And I think we should uh, think more widely about how to achieve alternative versions and not how to solve problems with this one particular technical implementation, because this, this constrains us a lot. And um, this push towards having uh, Fesco accept this solution because uh, Rel needs this solution and it needs it soon. Uh, this is setting again a bad, bad precedent, like with, like you mentioned, the, the push to, to merge modularity before Rel 8. Now we are kind of a few years later and we are repeating this story. Uh, so I think that we, uh, and the council should say, set high level goals and um, the technical details should be figured out in a uh, in mailing list threads and places where there is uh, stuff to to you know to write up a ten thousand word uh, description of some idea and not in a video meeting. Yeah, um, may I comment? <laughs> Sorry, yes, absolutely. Hi everyone. So. Uh, I want to uh, question why do we compare, like why do we consider alternatives to modularity to be um, like uh, to be replacement of modularity? Why don't we consider alternatives as alternatives which can be developed in parallel? I very much like the idea of like researching different solutions for the same problem. I think this is a good goal to have, like, to investigate different ways of, like, if if the goal is versioning, yeah, we, we can uh, we can try to address it with modularity. We can try to address it with different thing. I feel like we need to give space to anyone to experiment with this uh, technology. I don't see why you put it like as a requirement to remove modularity to start working on something new. Like, if there are people who want to work on something new, let them work on something new. If someone comes with the idea, like, let's create a totally different approach, let's do that. But we have people who want to work on modularity. And we want to uh, keep going in that direction as well. So it, it shouldn't be one or the other. It should be, let's try to do this and see how it works. I don't think that there is a need to... Yeah. Um, yeah, okay, sorry. Basically, I, I agree with Alexander that this might be possible, but you also need to look that look at that from a different angle. Uh, as Terry uh, already mentioned, we have an obligation to maintain the current implementation for next 10 years, which keeps us busy. And that will also require for my team, I mean, DNF team mainly, to support both implementations in DNF. And if there's multiple implementations, we would also support them so the users could eventually uh, choose which one to use. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm we should not ideally focus. Ah, sorry, go ahead. 
I'm not saying that both technologies should be supported by the same people. Yeah, I'm saying that we have a defined group of people who want to keep supporting one side. Uh, we, we already have those people. So uh, when you say let's do it completely differently and, and uh, as new, I'm not saying no, but I'm, not, I'm saying like, yes, let people, if there are people who want to do that, let them do this. But um, let the people who work on the older solution keep going because they, we know that this will be still supported. We will still have members in the community in Red Hat who will be supporting that. Here, here goes my tricky answer. If you find someone who would uh, take care of existing modularity for me so I can focus on the future, I will gladly do that. <laughs> Well, I think Alexander's I will... point is that 20 seconds. I think no. Alexander's point is about not stopping others, but about doing the changes, right? Like the stop energy there, just investing time into just preventing someone from fixing things is probably not the right thing. And yeah, if, if there's a group of people that just has this goal, they, we need to let them finish it, right? We can't just let them stop. We just can't. Mm -hmm stop them all the time. Yes. And there's another group that's strong enough to implement something better, I guess. There's so also cool. another side to this, that there's really nothing stopping people from working on modularity right now. Uh, so let's, and there's, it isn't. And, uh, well, it's, so I, mean, I think it's, the it's specific like, thing, the, right, yes, there is stuff stopping people from working on modularity right now. It is the fact that every time, Anyone comes to Fesco with a, with a uh, with a request to improve or change or 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 test something in modularity, people say no. Well, okay. So <laughs> let's let's. If this was a different case, if we were talking about NTP implementations, the way to do this is that you provide another implementation, you prove that it works, and that at some point you flip the default. And here, for some reason, we are talking about flipping the default first, and then as we are going on. Uh, adding the missing pieces. This, I don't think this is just the wrong order of things. I agree with your point, but I, I think uh, like we may have talked about it before, but what we're proposing currently at this very moment is exactly what you described. We don't, like I think no one on, in this room currently proposes enablement of modular models in Fedora right now at this point in the state which we have uh, right now. So what Not we right have well. proposed... Wait. Steven sure? is doing that. Uh, hello, no. Miro here. I'm finally, I can speak. If, if we agree that we don't want the default module streams right now, then, then we everybody would be happy. But every no, time no, that's wait, something wait. that's going to... Okay, go on. What we proposed and, and what led to this conversation. So we proposed a couple of weeks ago that we have ELN, which is a build root uh, of for Fedora Rawhide packages, which has no impact on uh, the main Fedora release. And in that build root, we uh, proposed to FESCO that we will be enabling default modules to uh, try and, and see if it works, if it can uh, work together with Fedora Rawhide packages in the same environment. That was our proposal. And then you say, we cannot do that because we need uh, modules in Fedora policy first. So this is how we came up to discuss in Fedora, Fedora models again. But our original intent was exactly what was described, like build it on this side, don't have impact on main Fedora, let it grow there separately. And then if it works there, we can come up with some idea how to make it work for Fedora as well. This, what, what is proposed, uh, we were not proposing modules in Fedora right at this state of things. Right, the only reason the policy I wrote generally is, speaks generally of Fedora is because Miro specifically said, I don't want a different policy for ELN and Fedora. So I just wrote it so that it would be applicable to both and we could only apply it to one at a time. Yeah, and at the same time, there was a proposal to say, we don't want default, default module streams at all because we think they are wrong. And it was said that this is not the way to go forward, that we actually need default module streams. And nothing of the uh, original needs for modularity actually says we need anything like this. And when, uh, when we actually... And, and uh, the problem here is that developers of modularity and developers of ELN and developers of modular packages 
think that they want to experiment with default modules. We don't uh, push you to agree with default modules in Fedora yet, but we want to experiment with this in the area which we maintain and we are responsible for. And this is a de not decision of uh, Fedora to say default modules are impossible. It's a technology, modularity is a technology, it may use default streams and default models. We want to try that on the side. Before we make any decisions on the future of this idea, we want to play with it and we have people who want to invest their time, like my time, Steven's time, maintainer's time, model or packager's time, to try this technology. That's what we were proposing. And now you say, like, you say, Default models don't make sense. If it don't make sense for you, you don't have to work on this with us, but you shouldn't block in us from working on that. Yeah, to go to the, the NTP analogy, this feels a lot like somebody who has a new NTP implementation and Fesco saying that implementation is a terrible idea. Um, we don't want that in Fedora and then um, and not allowing a spin with that implementation to be created. Um, because they don't like, you know, the color or the programming language it was in, or some something about it, um, what, whatever. Um, just not letting this people work. This is not on about it. color or programming languages. This is about problems that exist, problems that have been proven, problems that packages had, and nobody fixed their problems. Then we banned it, and now you want to enable it again when there is nobody who would fix the problems. The maintainers of this technology of would sure. like to know. The maintainers of this technology says they don't want default module streams in Fedora because they think that will only create problems. Uh, Why are I we may, pushing uh, it so hard? Uh, let me let me uh, clarify this. So my opinion is that the default streams really create some problems in Fedora. But on the other hand, ELN is a completely different uh, project, basically different distribution different target audience. And if they want to build that uh, using modules, I don't think uh, there's any reason why they shouldn't. And in this case, uh, they can potentially share some policies, but if they decide that, uh, for instance, they want to modularize everything and this is the goal, the users or consumers of ELN will probably have to live with that and if this turns to be not working they will definitely uh, change the policy or change the distribution accordingly furthermore there were two two main issues with default streams one was the upgrade path problem that is being addressed by the module eol and obsolete mm -hmm. and the other one was modules in the default build route which was addressed by the ursa prime proposal which works but none of those mm -hmm. are currently implemented because they were also stopped by FESCO or not. They are not currently. They, they were stopped because each one had significant yeah. shortcomings, right? It's not that so, they were stopped because they were being perfect. They were stopped because it was clear that they, despite being very complicated, don't actually solve many of the issues. Mm -hmm. And so, so uh, we're not I, mean, I, I think that with ELN, yeah. we are facing the <laughs> same same problem that. Uh, ELN was uh, advertised and approved as a way to have a um, real flavor of, of, of building packages in Fedora. But now, Which suddenly, two is weeks later, we are switching. Well, th this wasn't mentioned at all, right? And for me, well, th it didn't appear. There was a long discussion, and this, this, appear was, this idea wasn't floated during the discussion. Uh, but to me, it's the mm, providing modular packages to, to provide stuff for, for ELN is a completely different way of delivering packages. And it's not a um, rel-like build of Fedora anymore. And uh, it seems that enabling default streams in ELN will cause the same problems that it's causing Fedora. And uh, this, so, uh, we shouldn't sorry, just ignore if, that if, issue. If you're, if you're right, then this, then they will discover that quickly. Um, I really strongly agree with Alexandra that we need to provide the space for that experiment to happen and for the problems to be solved. If if you are right, you can get a good "I told you so" in. But um, I, David, well, thank you. I already got, got a good "I told you so" in the previous discussions and previous votes on modularity. Everything and that I happened with modularity that... was "told you so." 
And that, that the, so you say we need we to are... listen to Fedora while at the same time, nobody's listening. There were so yeah, many we're, things we're... going wrong. Okay, can you at least let me finish the sentence, please? You said ELN is a place where we build Fedora content for in real like environment. And now you're saying ELN is a different distribution. I think we need to get the story about okay. ELN, right? And if ELN is Fedora content, we should build Fedora content. And if Fedora doesn't want modular streams because it's a bad thing to do for Fedora, if, then ELN shouldn't have it either. If we want to build something completely different in ELN than Fedora, if we want to have modularized ELN and demodularized Fedora, it's no longer what was proposed as ELN. It's a completely so, different thing. Uh, regarding different distribution, it's not what I said, it's what Daniel said, and the wording is uh, different here, so please don't uh, treat it as contradiction. So ELN, uh, as I proposed it and as we uh, voted on it, is a place where we experiment on how uh, Fedora Height content can be packaged differently uh, in, a, in a way which resembles how Enterprise Linux does it. This includes build root Compile, compile flags. This includes also, for example, the structure of a compose. And uh, it was the intent of the ELN to uh, create a different layout, different set of comps files, different layout for uh, repositories which we uh, create from this Fedora Rawhide content. For me, modularity is uh, is that part. It's it's not the content of Fedora height which we're changing, it's the structure of the artifact which we get out, out of this content which we're changing. So uh, for me there is no contradiction. contradiction. I, I agree you, you, you may see it differently but uh, the, the idea is that uh, default modules is basically a, a question of which packages we include in the ELN build root and this is, like, for me, it's the same question as how comps files for ELN are configured, how composed structure for ELN is created. And this is what we promised we will be experimenting on. And when you say uh, we have pr proven that in Fedora modularity doesn't work and default models don't work, I think uh, we clearly have on this meeting uh, the understanding that not everyone believes that this is true. So what we are asking right now from FESCO and from Consul is that to give us a space where we can prove to ourselves or to you that this is actually true or, or, or if it's not true, then prove that it. it's not true. So you say you're convinced default models won't work. That's okay. We don't try to uh, convince you right now that they will. We want to work as our separate group in ELN to see for ourselves, if we can convince ourselves that it will work or not. This is what we are asking for. I, I have a don't question see the problem about, with giving us the opportunity to do that. Yeah, go on. I have a question about the did not work. Um, is it that it truly didn't work or we didn't quite finish it and we just need to finish fixing a few things and then we believe it can work? I think we that, that is the that. question that is up for debate. Um, I think there are people that believe both of those statements to be true very vigorously. Um, and so that's and, and that's why I really strongly think that we need to have the space for experimentation. And I think this is what Fedora, when, whenever we have a thing like this, Fedora should provide these spaces because that's, that's what we do. Um, we already so did. I would like to see, I would like to see uh, at least a proposal for how turning modularity on for ELN will address the problems already seen with modularity. That's been like a simple ask. And then what the what the scope is of of modularity, because as I stated in the last meeting, the viral nature of modules forcing other packages to become modules is a concern with the developer experience. Like what what is the scope? Neil made a point earlier that um, modules have to be fully self-contained. We, 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 we keep talking about them as, as modules as their standalone entities, but they're not really. They're linked against the entire OS. Like shared libraries are still at play. And when we, if we're going to allow packages that are not in modules to depend on packages that are in modules, now we get into this, Sort of weird territory so that's why i keep bringing up 
what is the scope and what is the what is the expectation of modules? Like if if it's gonna consume a develop package that's used by something else. I mean, this is this is a developer experiencing, and we've turned this into a Fesco meeting. But this is the kind of stuff that we talk about because it does really impact the yeah. developer experience. And it's quite frustrating, and that ask has been there. And all we keep getting, all we keep hearing back is, yeah, but just let us turn it on. We just want to play with it. And I have a I'm question. Of turning it on if we have a plan for how to address those things we've already seen. I have a question. Uh, have you seen the proposal of a policy on default modules Stephen has posted? Have you had a chance to read it yet? No. When when was it posted? Okay. 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 Uh, Very so, recently. So, so, uh, as apparently like a couple days ago. Um, he, he linked it in the chat so you can pick it up again if you don't if you want. So. So. I, um, I just I, wanted to comment three more lines. <laughs> so. Uh, I think uh, your point is, is, is good one, but, but we probably need to formalize more of what we want to try. So I think Stephen uh, made this proposal. It actually addresses this concern you have. Uh, so what we currently have is a very restrictive policy on default modules. We are not even sure that uh, RHEL modules uh, actually can work with this restrictive policy. So if we try this policy right now, this will be a challenge for RHEL to fit in as well as it will be a challenge for Fedora to fit in. And I really want to have this very restrictive policy uh, to see in action if we can make at least one module to work with this. this. That would be a challenge on its own. That's what I would love to see in ELN first before we even go further in the development of a for, for more modules and more more, more stuff in there. The, the policy okay, definitely well, I'm going to have to read that. I'm going to have to find that and read it. Sorry. Um, yeah, uh, that's okay. I'll, I'll go and, and, and read that and at least get up to date on that information. I will say one more thing um, about the uh, concern about what ELN actually is. Having Having been involved with Fedora and RHEL for a very long time, and I've seen multiple what we call RHEL Rawhide um, tries come and go, the farther away that ELN diverges from Rawhide, the more likely it is not going to be useful to serve as a testing area for what becomes RHEL. So the concern I have there is with, um, and Alexander, I think I mentioned this to you, with uh, creating branches and just get things like that. As soon as we start doing that for ELN, it does become more and more divergent from Rawhide, which makes it harder and harder to maintain. So anything we can do to keep ELN from doing that will, I think, I think will lead to ELN's success as a area to test things intended for RHEL and CentOS. Uh, I thank you, David. Very much. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Me, I let you go last time. My, my turn. Uh, Sorry. David, yeah, yeah, no, it's okay. Uh, thank you for um, uh, that. I think that's really good insight. And then also, I think your your request for a plan and what's going to happen is is a reasonable one. Um, I have, and since this is a Fesco meeting now, um, I, I have a technical suggestion that I, I think um, will help address a lot of these issues if it's possible. Um, and that is the thing that. Um, was part of Stephen's um, but revised modularity plan initially, which then got dropped, uh, which is for um, packages built as de built in the modular system um, as default modules to get actually tagged into the non-modular repo as non-modular, just regular RPMs. And uh, the reason that didn't work was, as I understand it, because uh, that modules can conflict. If we want default modules to not conflict, that actually um, should be possible again, and also actually helps enforce the they can't conflict thing by making um, those conflicts obvious. Yeah. Peter is shaking his head at me because he doesn't think that's possible. There are other other technical uh, but, bits that that make this impossible. So no. Yeah, there's a whole <laughs> of issues there. Uh, uh, Steve, Steven says we can do it though, so uh, hey, well, I, that's a thing I I said that. 
the major reason we couldn't do this in the past was because we had uh, we had as a design philosophy that that modules could have dependencies and that the dependencies could change. The current rest highly restrictive policy reduce uh, eliminates that major problem. There, uh, that does not mean that there are not other problems waiting in the wings. That was just the one that simply re re prevented it from ever happening, from ever even being considered. That's something I would like to see experimented with because it does it removes it it removes the the quote viral nature of it because these base packages can just be used as non module packages and then if you enable the module then suddenly the module the metadata is available. Um, so it allows the reason is people. Uh, yeah. Uh, the, the, those RPMs are specially flagged by MBS. So that RPM knows that they are modular, even if the modular metadata gets corrupted or is missing or something. So if you just put them in the non-modular repo, they will still mess things up. Also, DNF will refuse to install packages that are marked with this label because yeah. of right. because and of the feedback that These are these are solvable problems. We will have all these problems, problems in ELN. You know, you see. So all these problems you mentioned, they yeah. will appear in ELN, and we will have to solve them with Red Hat help. With or we will have to cancel this idea. So we actually can try this in ELN, fail or win, depending on the environment, but we won't uh, damage anything in Fedora by trying. That's, that's the main point from ELN SIG here. So I think that it's actually perfectly fine, and I want to see this actually happen in Fedora through ELN because um, because we aborted so early, we couldn't, it, it was a lot harder to figure out the full scope of the, the faults in the existing, in the existing infrastructural design. I'm not going to comment on like the other total design on the, on the other part of it, but the infrastructural design, uh, as I've seen it experienced with and tend to tried to work with is we haven't fully fleshed out what we need to make that work. And, and I think ELN is a good place to figure that all out. However, one of the constraints that I'm really, I have some very deep misgivings about is that the, dis, the constraint that we must, uh, that we cannot change, we cannot change the underlying user experience for modules, both developer and user side, because that's what they are in RHEL. That, that restriction needs to be removed for us to be able to succeed in making this a useful project. The last few times that I have given particular feedback, and even I've talked to Daniel Mock and, and Yaroslav and like, started working on patches and stuff the the result of it was we can't change this because rel says we can't that we need it to work this way and that is not acceptable for evolving a solution for future rel or even fedora like i'm not like i'm going to ignore the fact that this is about fedora i'm saying that for future rel it is not okay that present rel blocks future rel like that's that's just not okay so as long as that constraint goes away i think modularity as a solution as an initiative has actual hope for success. But if we if we anchor ourselves to Rel 8, we're screwed. Are you still here, Terry? He I am. Had to... oh, there you are. No, I, I, <laughs> I am. Uh, I am uh, preparing my sourdough loaves to get them ready to go into the oven. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. That, that was my, uh, my lunchtime plans. Uh, before this call ran over. Um, I hear you loud and clear. The, the Red Hat software management team has been focused on fixing current problems, in particular the Fedora 32 upgrade problems. Um, so, so we have a challenge. We know RHEL 8 is going to have some, some needs like we want to deliver more module, we want to deliver more application streams, which means, you know, newer modules like Perl 5.30 and a few other things. Um, we also have some other layered product things like the Vert team needs to deliver multiple versions of the Vert client tools so that um, multiple client tool versions are available to end users. Um, to choose from depending on what hypervisor version. So we have a number of of important needs and so the team has been focused very much on the context expansion problems, uh, the module upgrade problems and things like that. 
So it's not that we're saying you can't work on something new. What we're saying is we have these big major problems that need to be fixed as soon as possible with the current design implementation. And we can't just introduce radically new module metadata constructs or a total redesign into RHEL 8 to fix those things. So that's well, I would we, we need to find balance, I guess. So like simple, very simple example that I was told no multiple times when it kept coming up as a problem was I need a way to enable switch and distro sync in one action from one module stream to another. Like I, I can't just have things break because I need to request content from one thing to another and I don't control the base layer. Um, there's an RFE yeah. for it and things like that. And it's just, I don't, I don't want to say let's burn everything with modularity and start all over from scratch. Cause one, I don't think that's realistic. And two, it's not even necessary. Like functionally the metadata is mostly fine. Uh, the, the tooling just kind of stinks, but that can be improved. The user experience, the user experience constraints are the ones that I'm the most concerned about because the user experience constraints are what are 90% of the negative attitude to modularity. Like the I, having spent a year re-implementing a lot of this infrastructure myself at work, like I, I'm keenly aware that this actually solves major problems, can be made very useful, but it's but we have to be able to reconsider the restrictions that were imposed in the user experience. I'm not saying we change everything else, but we need a better user experience at every level. The stream switching, isn't that one of the items on the list at the end of yon survey? As I believe it is. so. It is. Okay. Yes. So, so we listened to that. We agree. Um, I had to do a little bit of work on my end to say, yes, the developers need stream switching, and I think regular RHEL users will be too. So I mm -hmm. did a little bit of work to fight that battle on my side. Unfortunately, it, it didn't come in time for Fedora 32, and I think it's targeting Fedora 33. Is that right, Daniel? Uh, no, uh, we are probably <laughs> not uh, going to make it because uh, we need to start working on the uh, end of life, end of solids first. Oh, yeah, both of those things are actually going to be both of those are going to be tied to each other to some extent. Um, but like, I can't build images layered on top of other images. Like we're talking container things because if the base layer chooses a stream and I need to switch to a different one and they're compatible software wise and dependency wise, but because of this locking mechanism, I can't change anything like that. That's painful and that's very broken. So we are, we are running up to 90 minutes on our 60 minute meeting here. Oh, so I think, uh, at you. <laughs> th thank you everybody. This has been a good, good discussion on a, on a heated topic. Um, and uh, I think we'll need, uh, obviously the discussion needs to continue back on mailing lists and things. It might be useful for us to have another video meeting like this sometime pretty soon, uh, because I think the, high bandwidth conversations are helpful and the uh, closer to personal interactions also can be better than mailing lists. Um, not that we, we need those discussions too. Um, the whatever 20,000 word rants that were, were mentioned, but um, I think this is, was also good. So uh, thank you everybody for coming and participating. Um, there's a huge number of comments in the chat here as well, which I was not able to keep up with. Um, so uh, if there are important chat comments, please bring those to the mailing list and so on. Um, I will try to get this posted on our YouTube channel uh, as soon as possible as well so that people who weren't able to make it at this time can uh, join the fun. Again, uh, thank you very much, everybody, and I'll see you later. Bye. Bye, y'all.